Hello, everyone. Welcome back to AAS YouTube channel. I'm here again with Chris Impey. Hey, everyone. And we're going to continue on the teaching, uh, teaching astronomy online tools and tips that you can use. And this module is going to be on video. Uh, so we have a number of topics that we'll cover associated with video. Uh, and Chris, why don't you go ahead and start off with uh, your choice of where you want to start? Uh, sure. Well, I mean, I guess the, as the caveat or framing comment, we're not today going to be talking about the, the sort of standard uh, process of filming your lecture videos, which which many of you are, of course, having to do if you're moving online for the first time. Um, that's a process that universities are cap fully capable of supporting and do support and will support. So we're talking about you know other uses of video for enriching a class online and how you can do it yourself without you know necessarily depending on the infrastructure of your your university since you're probably isolated in your home um and uh i guess the you know the overarching question is why should you why would you bother why not if if video is a component of an online class uh, why wouldn't it just be the lectures? That's all, plain and simple. Um, I don't, we, we probably should eat answer aspects of that question too. Why would you use videos? Um, so, so in my case, um, well, there's, there's a range of other uses of videos. I do uh, video, uh, live video sessions for, for my class, either a university class or a massive open online class. I did one actually today for my MOOC and we're like 180 people online. The MOOC, and interestingly, for those of you doing MOOCs or thinking of them, MOOC enrollments are surging right now because oh, people have a lot of time on their hands and these are, they're still mostly free. And so they're thinking, sure, why not? Um, so, you know, live uh, FAQ sessions, um, but also, you know, both for your own use as an instructor and for students who might want to do projects in your class. If you just open up the envelope of a standard project, which in a you know 20th century model is a is a term paper, you know, and just the thought of that makes gives you a visual of chewing sawdust, you know, without water to wash it down with. Why why would you want to read term papers, especially a hundred of them, 150 of them, uh, and plug them, chug them through, turn it in to see how plagiarized they are, because they're all going to be. So anyway, video, um, I mean, modeling good behavior for your students. I mean, you can use videos to, um, you know, just juice up your class in all sorts of ways. You could have like a video series. I'm just off the top of my head here because I haven't done this particular thing for a long time. You could just make a little video series as you progress through the course on misconceptions or, uh, you know, gotchas or just things that you notice a lot of your students are having trouble with. And your courses, you know, your course videos have been filmed. I mean, this, the stuff is in the can, so you need some way of sort of augmenting your content according to what you learn as you go on. Um, you can, in astronomy, of course, you know, it's sometimes good to get out there, you know, so some of this doesn't have to be in a room or in a studio or your basement. Um, you know, you might wanna uh, just go out to a fixed point uh, weekly and this could be a student project too and look at the you know the setting sun and the angle of the setting sun or the particular constellation that's first visible that needs a slightly better camera than most people have um so so there are a number of ways of using video how, how do you use video frank um <clears throat> i use it in a couple ways one of the most effective ones and just to pick up your point on on term papers is uh generally students love to do collaborative projects with videos, you set them, you know, give out six, seven, eight different projects and just let them go. Uh, they will encourage collaboration among small groups, which is always a good thing in, in education. And they enjoy it a lot more and they'll put a lot more effort into it than one of those sawdust um, Wikipedia cut and paste uh, term papers. So, so mm -hmm. considering turning your students loose on video and uh, of course they've, most of your, um, Younger students have probably grown up on video. Video is a very big thing for them, so that they, they really enjoy it. So I use it that way. Uh, I also do spice up my classes by doing videos of lab questions, particularly quantitative questions, uh, that there's uh, teeth gnashing going on or something along those lines that didn't quite come across. So yeah. I will get on and I will work through um, or provide guidance how to do a quantitative problem. Sometimes I'll just talk it through. Sometimes I'll do like a screencast of it. Um, so I'm writing down whatever the equation is, uh, you know, solve for X and plug in and go. 
Mm -hmm. um, so it can be very useful for, for quantitative uh, work as well. Uh, I also do do, do office hours for 10,000, right. uh, which, which works well. Again, it's their chance to see you live uh, as opposed to, to something canned. And having, uh, the, having the mass uh, attendance, let's say, say, say it is a big class, I mean, that's really helpful because as we know, um, a lot of students have the same type of questions, exactly the same questions or run through the same problems in the class. Right. They're often not you know, willing to go to your classical 20th century office hours in your office, just you and them. Um, and you know, they're shy or they just don't, are not motivated enough to go to the office hours or doesn't fit their schedule, any number of reasons. But if you have live office hours, you know, it's almost certain that the stuff people are asking will be shared concerns or questions of a lot of people. Um, uh, back to the back to the other uses of videos uh, beyond I mean for significant pieces of work like a project like a term project that's totally fine but if you are using a tool like VoiceThread which allows for more rapid cadence weekly assignments um, then that VoiceThread and other equivalent tools that's one a lot of universities have you can uh, make a prompt and post an assignment um, could be based on news story and astronomy, something that's up in the night sky, whatever, anything that's timely. Um, they can post their response to that assignment as, as a written thing if they want to do that or as a PowerPoint if they want to do that. And if you give them the choice and they know how to do it with the, just their phones, this is low grade video here, uh, they often like to do a video response, you know, I mean, Okay, it's, it's very impromptu. They don't need a script and maybe it's a little <laughs> unformed compared to the thought that might have to go into a written thing. But, but often it's really good actually and entertaining. And, and then of course in VoiceThread and these other platforms, uh, you, students get some credit for commenting on each other's work and the, the video that's done well, of course, will attract attention. A another thing that I can sort of throw out there since we're all kept out of our physical classrooms is you could uh, you might consider filming a set of the demos or hands-on things that you might do in the front of the classroom you know to get a grad student or in a, you know your spouse or child or someone to help you if you need help mm -hmm. and uh, you need a slightly you know you need a setup that will allow you to film that y you can also film things that are no not allowed in the classroom there's a thing i do on uh, stellar lifetimes where I use uh, sparklers where you know, you're trying to show that uh, you know bigger stars burn hotter and faster so you have a single sparkler and then a bundle of three and then a bundle of seven and you light them and time them uh, you know that that breaks all the fire regulations Absolutely. At, at the university but in my home or in my backyard I can do that and it's really dramatic by the way if you haven't done it I recommend it it's not too hard to get sparklers because the the, the, the regular sparkler, of course, takes 25 seconds to burn down. The three solar mass sparkler takes about 10 seconds. And the seven solar mass one almost takes your fingers off. Oh, so you so your it. it almost explodes. It's really fast. Oh, so well, uh, yeah. demos, they're like really, you know, oh, nice very good. demos like that. And, the, you know, the, in a sense, though, more humorous, a little humor, a little funny. They don't always work. Well, that's fine. Life in life, that's the case, too. Um, anyway, so there, there's plenty of things. So just, you know, all of you out there can just think of, oh, let's see, what could, what was amenable for a short video treatment? And you'll probably think of other things too. And uh, speaking of, to one thing you can do to help spark some of your ideas is, um, you may not be aware, but the uh, IAU Division C uh, Commission C2, there is a communicating astronomy with the public journal it's called CAP. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will put a link in the video down below to the journal. And they've been going since the year of astronomy or so, so about 2007 or so. A little bit sporadic on the publication schedule, but there's some really interesting articles in there that may spark your ideas, of whether you're doing sparklers or just give you ideas of different things to do um, with videos. And in fact, Chris um, uh, had an article in the CAP on video for astronomy education and outreach. So I'll put mm -hmm. a link to that in the video as well. So there is a lot of resources out there besides, you know, what we're talking about. And I encourage you to uh, go look at some of that literature and uh, spark your creativity. So to the practical side, what do you need to do this? And uh, what's the, you know, you, you don't want to go out and 
break the bank and buy a bunch of new equipment if you may not be doing it long term or you decide it's not for you. Um, so I, I guess we should talk about sort of the, the, the minimum, the floor on what you would need to get started and then maybe sort of an, a more ideal case where the quality is good enough for almost any purpose. Exactly. We almost all own a device that is actually pretty darn good. The sensors in the modern iPhones are actually pretty amazing. Um, yeah, and you can get stands so you don't have to hold it because they're, they're sensitive enough. If you're standing there holding it yakking away, you're going to be moving your hand around and it'll you know, come across as jittery. So get a stand for it. Set up a stand for it and uh, it'll be a lot, uh, lot smoother on the video on a, on a fixed angle anyway. Now, and also we're, you know, we and you all, I'm sure, routinely are using your little webcam that's sitting on top of your computer or laptop. Uh, and those are also, I, I'm just trying to think, do you know technically how they compare to the sensor in a, you know, iPhone 10 or something? I'm not sure. Uh, they are of similar quality. Yeah. So in particular, what I'm using right now, um, I have set up sort of a uh, standard YouTube blogger setup as far as video and audio and lighting, and we'll talk about that when we get there. But I'm running a, a Logitech a 1080p, so it shoots at 30 frames per second, mm -hmm. um, uh, and it's 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 good enough. It costs uh, fifty dollars, mm -hmm. um, so that's about on the I would say low end or the minimum end of of what you want to do is you can get away with a 720p. Um, those are okay, not as good as your phone. Uh, a modern iPhone, anyway, or modern uh, mobile device, I should say. Right, and and that's a good uh, place to make a comment that, in terms of you know, without getting all specky on you, I mean, in terms of resolution and and so on, 720p is is now you know that's that's kind of that's pretty marginal resolution. That's probably below where you want to be, especially because the cost of the hardware is so low. So I would recommend you be a 1080, you know, p minimum resolution and that's fine that's completely adequate do be aware though that at 30 frames per second that actually starts to chew up disk space fairly fast uh yeah <laughs> so as soon as you get it uploaded to youtube or wisteria or whatever platform your um, university allows you can remove it from your those 200 300 400 megabyte movie files um, from your, your local hard drive and actually, and just to extend the range, um, when we started getting into, uh, in our group, we started getting into student produced videos and, you know, wanted to set up a little mini studio setup. Again, not really very expensive. We, we got a Canon uh, 80D, it's a DSLR camera, mm -hmm. which yep. has video capability. Uh, and that has a large sensor, so that's, that's a 4K, you know, that's the, that's the high, higher level and uses very high quality photographic lenses so you know uh canon nikon these these cameras and you know their prices are also coming down i mean the good ones are you know the good ones of course can hit 800 to a thousand but yeah. five or six hundred actually get you a pretty a very good one indeed so yeah and uh i'll just throw out you know where that technology is heading right 30 frames per second is pretty standard these days youtube does support 60 frames per second, which gives you sort of a buttery smooth video. And so a number of these uh, newer cameras will shoot at 60 frames per second and things like YouTube do support it. Um, so if you want to bump up a little bit, um, that's one direction to consider going. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, audio, um, as I mentioned, I'm doing, uh, I sort of have a standard blogger set up and so I can't, I couldn't show you my camera, but I can show you my audio. So I'm using, um, this is a Yeti directional microphone. Uh, it cost me about $80. And then in front of it is what's known as a pop screen. And so this is when you say your hard consonants that it um, smooths out your B's and your D's, boat, dog. Um, so you don't get that big spike in the volume. Uh, and th this is a very standard blogger YouTube that does very nice audio quality um, for what you're paying for it. So you don't need the big booms coming in and um, that kind of stuff. I would try and move away from lapel microphones. They, you will get a pretty uneven quality of video with those because they're mm -hmm. really on the low end. So that's probably a little too low end to go. I mean, if you have nothing else, it, you got to use what you got to use. Um, so by, by lapel, you're including lavaliers in that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
and 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 those are pretty familiar to most people. And and yes, lavaliers are they're they're very convenient. And of course, you know they you can get them they're wireless, of course, so you can uh, move around. But we're talking about kind of stationary video. But yes, they do have problems in, of directionality, and and they kind of pick up a lot of stuff. We we have a we have the mic that uh, Frank just showed you, and we also have a boom mic. Um, <clears throat> and those are the advantage there is they're very directional. So if you're in a a sound situation where there's some extraneous noise, you know, where there's something going on in the corridor outside or, or, you know, you're not in a completely quiet situation, that directionality will actually shut it completely out. It's really good. So, so if you, if you're in a situation where a place where you think you're going to do a lot of filming is, is really good, except for the extraneous noise that doesn't completely kill the activity but means it would be an annoying background noise and it, you'd probably need a boom mic. So for example your kids playing in the background while you're working at home, your mm -hmm. dog uh, scratching at the door, things like that, you can get rid of almost all of that with some directionality to the, to the microphone. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah definitely something to consider. Um, and associated with audio since we're talking about audio you know we, we should we can talk briefly about the space, the ideal space. Oh. You just don't need, you know, there are obviously, if you go into a high quality professional recording studio, the, you know, it's a, it's a highly controlled space with soft surfaces and anechoic uh, tiles and ceiling, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that's, that's a big deal. But, um, and, and, you know, we film across from my office in Stewart in just a kind of clunky office with linoleum and tiles and wooden doors. And it's very boomy and echoey. But it's amazing that just just throwing down a few rugs and I mean you can or or hanging some fabric on a wall. I mean if you, if you have a space that you can just deck out modestly, you can muffle a lot of that kind of sound. You can make it actually pretty decent. Most most small spaces. Right. So for example, pay attention to the background that Chris has got up. Right. That's it's a very yeah. simple curtain, but it acts as a very effective um, sound catcher, so you don't get those echoes coming off the back. Well, uh, I'm actually sitting in my home. Uh, uh, office right now, and that is actually a blind behind me. I, I prefer a uniform color background. So you do want to try and minimize the noisiness, I guess, of your background. Um, so try and do something a little more uniform. Uh, you know, the one Chris has is pretty uniform. It's that sort of a star motif to it or a constellation motif to it. Um, mm -hmm. But it's uniform, although it does have a pattern to it. So this will help keep the focus. Uh, on on what you're talking about as opposed to the cat that may be bouncing around your bookshelf or something along those lines. Right. Um, lighting, I guess, would be the next yeah. thing. Yeah, um, that's good. I mean, it's, you know, there's a number of ways to go. But again, assuming you're just trying to be minimalist here and not get, you know, fancy, uh, like we do have a cowboy studio kit in our office for doing a lot of filming, but you don't need that with these in you know, these sort of soft box lights. And we have three of those and you can angle them and avoid all those kind of glares. And You know, having shiny foreheads and that's a kind of annoying, you know, you don't really want that. But if you just had um, a couple, three would be great, two is probably enough, just adjustable uh, LED studio lights, then mm -hmm. that'll do it, you know, uh, that are adjustable in angle and height. Um, that's that's going to be fine. Um, those are about 50 bucks. So I actually run two of those. I, I prefer uh, umbrella lights. And so it's really just um, uh, a bulb, uh, in this case, a, a coil bulb. It's about 40 watts each one. And right in front of it then is, is an umbrella, literally an umbrella. It's usually a white mm -hmm. translucent kind of umbrella. Um, and again, those were those were 50 bucks and I run two of them. I run both on uh, both on either side. Uh, but lighting is is will make a tremendous difference in your videos. Uh, if it's all dark and it can't really see you, or there's a lot of um, sharp terminators between light and dark, you know, on your face or on your background, um, it, it does detract a little bit from what you're trying to say because you're more, you know, the eye was more focused on these you know strange patterns mm -hmm. of shadows. So if you if you can swing the fifty bucks. Um, or not just makeshift one. You can also just makeshift an umbrella light uh, to get a diffuse light background on you. It will improve the quality of your videos enormously. And since we're talking backdrops, the other really obvious one, because it just 
puts instant versatility and flexibility into your product is is a green screen. So mm -hmm. um, and green screens are really cheap. I mean, they're you know I, I we've had different kinds over the years, and I haven't found any great distinction between them. I mean, you know, you're a sort of six by four foot or six by nine foot green screen is going to be fine and you can pin it up or I mean some of them are self-supporting and so on but just just even pinning up a fabric one will work pretty well yep. the main operational thing which we just learned by trial and error we didn't probably do our homework and read about it is uh, when you want to when you want to work a green screen and key it out nicely and not leave a little ugly flaring yeah so you're don't, don't sit too close to the green screen see like I'm Wait, I'm too close to this curtain than I would be. You, you pretty much need to be three feet in front of a green screen. Otherwise, the backscatter, the reflected light will, uh, will, will lead to these edge effects and flares, which are a beast to take out. After yeah. You just don't want to have them in your initial video. Um, so that's such a really simple thing. So you do need at least enough space to sort of back yourself off the green screen by three feet, I would say. Agreed. Uh, and this will sort of get us into a little bit about uh, production tools, software production tools, post-production tools. So if you are going to use a green screen, um, you probably don't want to show your video with the green screen. So the advantage of keying it out is you can put uh, an appropriate background on there. You can do things like if you're talking off slides, you can put your slides up in the um, in the upper right corner as you're talking about it. And so it's, uh, uh, it's, it's fixed next to your head. You can... Uh, put up a variety of images depending on what you want to do but yeah the, the whole point of the green screen is to allow you to uh, change the background and you will need software tools to do that so, uh, go ahead Chris yeah software and that and that's that's something where um, your, your university can help I mean you you can have you can be fairly sure I'm sure wherever you work that your university will have a site license for I would think all the Adobe suite of products which includes Adobe Premiere which is mm -hmm. a really good and powerful tool. Uh, we actually mostly use that but we started with Final Cut Pro I think 10 or whatever number they're up to now which is just a little it, the learning curve not as beastly you know not as bad so we'll be found fine Final Cut Pro easier to get started with and, and students could learn to use it pretty well too. And it has advanced features. I mean, it can do keyframe animation and, and the green screen and so on. Um, uh, Premiere is, is, especially if you in include the After Effects add-in, you know, it can pretty much do anything. It's almost overwhelming what it can do. Um, and it, again, you're not going to be buying it. You almost certainly have a site license through your university, but you should find out what they have. Uh, right. And uh, those of you who watch some of the other AAS YouTube channels and wondering what I use for that, um, I use uh, something called ScreenFlow, uh, which has got a lot of controls to it. You can have multiple videos running or multiple images. Um, in fact, that's what you see when you look at some of those, like um, uh, being an author in the AAS journals, just to give a plug there. Um, and it's also a full featured um, program. Uh, it ran me about a hundred dollars uh, to get it. It's a it's a commercial product, but very easy to use, very friendly. Um, I liked it. Mm -hmm. And of course, then you just have the straight old Zoom, you know, just record and go, which is what we're doing here. There's no post post production value here. <laughs> this, is, this is the really low grade stuff. Right. And and if you've got uh you know if you're at the 1080 level and we're even more so at the 4K and you're doing this more than occasionally, uh, and you're using these, these software packages are, you know, they're, they're a little they're greedy. They're a little greedy of computer power. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, that is going in our favor. What you can buy in a laptop or a, a computer now for $1,000 or $800 is amazing. Um, but you need some serious uh, horsepower, actually, to do this kind of work. It, it can Anything that, that say uh, a typical laptop older than four or five years old will actually probably struggle uh, oh on this kind of work. But anything that's more recent than that almost certainly will be fine. You will fill up disk space. So, you know, terabyte hard drives are, you know, again, dirt cheap at the cost of those. I mean, as you're hearing, the cost of everything from the cameras to obviously the computation and the storage, even the mics is just coming down. So this is a 
this is a, an area where, you know, your the technology is all in your favor. Um, and, and most of the, you know, what most of the good quality science videos you'll see on YouTube are, are done with what in the spectrum we've been talking about, the sort of higher end mm -hmm. uh, hardware and software, you know, because the, the bar has been raised over the years of YouTube. Um, you know, the sort of jerky handheld phone stuff. Yeah, sure, that's still there. But the stuff that will impress your students and the stuff that will impress you, not done that way. Uh, speaking of that, just to mention that, uh, instead of doing a studio thing, another thing that does work, uh, and you can see some good quality examples of that on astronomy themed YouTube channels and, and getting out is, is using your GoPro. Um, so mm -hmm. those GoPro models will produce it perfectly fine uh, 1080p type 30 frame per second and it's uh, so you can get out on site or show yourself out how to work your telescope or whatever it may be so um, those those mobile webcams if you like um, work really well for uh, getting out of the studio right and um, so I mean we think we're getting towards the end of what we want to talk about but something just occurred to me as a, a sort of a simple suggestion for how you might sort of juice up your your online course. Um, I mean, just just have like a weekly update. Just 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 take do what we're doing, but not as not for as long. Just take five or six minutes, and every on every weekend, say, just post a little, you know, a very chatty, colloquial, friendly uh, thing about what you're going to cover this week. And oh, by the way, did you see the story about that wacko exoplanet? And did you notice that? how bright Jupiter is and where, you know, just throwing a few, throwing some things to just get mm -hmm. them engaged in the subject rather than just very pedagogical of we're going to be covering this on Monday and this on Wednesday and this on Friday. Cause well, you're online, they're going to be binging your video lectures and, and probably you don't know when they're going to do it, but doing just like a little weekly update, that's a kind of easy thing to do. Really just a couple of minutes a week is enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, and with that, uh, I think we've talked enough about uh, sort of getting rolling on videos and tools and tips. So I want to thank everybody for uh, watching this one, um, and we will see you on the next one. Thanks. Okay, bye. Thanks, Mike.